Thank you very much, Professor Mlinek, for this um, presentation. We, we really would be important for Italy to have something similar and to increase collaboration. And uh, thank you very much for your experience, to share, for having shared your experience, and also for having stressed the importance of evidence and facts, as already the ambassador said. Something that is important also for the humanities, by the way. And, um, and now we come back to, in a certain sense, big data, but with demography. And our last speaker for this evening is Director Emilio Zagheni, born in Crema, Lombardy. Emilio Zagheni received a master's degree in economics from Bocconi University and a second master's degree in statistics and a PhD in demography from the University of California at Berkeley. He's managing director now of the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research and affiliate associate professor of sociology at the University of Washington, so quite in this interdisciplinary also, where he was director of the Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology. Zagheni is known for his combination of digital data and traditional sources to track migration. In 2016, he received the Trailblazer Award for Demographic Analyse, Analysis from the European Association for Population Studies for his achievements in digital and computational demography. As co-chair of Digital Demography Panel in the International Union for Scientific Studies of Population, he works to facilitate interaction between demographers, stati statisticians, and computational social scientists. This evening, he will be speaking of migration of scientists, which is a sufficiently cross-cutting phenomenon across disciplines and personal stories, as we have heard tonight, to provide a suitable conclusion for this wonderful series of talks that we have heard so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara, for this uh, very gracious introduction, and thank you to the, to the organizers for inviting me. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be part of uh, this event. So tonight, I'm going to talk about mobility of scientists and uh, recombination of ideas. Now, as I am a demographer by training, let me just start with uh, a little bit of a demographic puzzle. So let's assume that uh, it's the beginning of the year, and in January, you have two newly born rabbits, one male and one female. Then it takes about a month for them to grow to maturity and to be able to reproduce. They reproduce, they give birth to a couple of uh, rabbits, one male and one female. And then each of them continue to reproduce every month as long as they reach maturity at, uh, one, after one month of, uh, of life. So a question is, how many pairs of rabbits would we have, for example, at the beginning of the next uh, year? Now, I'm showing you this uh, riddle because this is something that was proposed by uh, Fibonacci and discussed by him in the year 1202. This statue is a statue of Fibonacci that you can still see if you go to Pisa at uh, Camposanto. Now, it turns out that this number is 233, but that's not really an interesting thing. The interesting thing is that if we sort of follow this uh, sequence, we get what is known as the Fibonacci series, which has a number of properties. One of them is that if you divide each number in this sequence by the predecessor, you get a number that converges to an irrational number that is about one, that starts with 1.618 and, and so on which is constant and uh, is well known as the golden ratio. Now, the golden ratio is everywhere. It's everywhere in nature. You can find it at the supermarket when you sort of look at uh, uh, Romanesco broccoli, you find beautiful spirals. And for each bud, the sort of the relationship to in size to the predecessor is constant and approximately equal to the golden ratio. The golden ratio is beautiful. It has uh, uh, aesthetic pleasingly properties. And so we see applications in art, in, for paintings, for architecture, and so on. And even applications to uh, financial trading and different types of uh, financial uh, types of uh, operations. Now, 
I'm showing you this, and so I'm talking, you, I'm talking about this uh, ratio, mainly because I wanted to show that often we can start with one problem in science, we can start with a demographic problem, a demographic process, and we may end up with something very different that has applications in all sorts of fields. And that's really what science is about. We develop some tools, then someone else from a different, to, different field may take some of these tools and may lead to sort of innovative uh, contributions. Now, the way this happens is, so this happens in multiple ways. Scientists talk to each other, but one of the mechanisms that particularly favors this is international mobility that sort of favors exchange of ideas and the recombination of ideas and so on. And so what I would like to sort of talk about today and sort of focus on is mobility of science, scientists and show some patterns that we have observed with a couple of uh, recent studies. So I'm going to talk about uh, some results that we obtain using bibliometric data. So bibliometric data are essentially metadata from publications. And so we use this large uh, abstract and citation database that's called Scopus. It includes more than 77 million articles. And then we use this information in order to make some inference about migration of scientists. So there are lots of details in the, in the methods, but the idea is very simple. Say, if we know, we can, we can track people and their affiliations, so scientists and their affiliations based on their publications. So if someone published regularly with an affiliation like Humboldt University up until say 2015, and then suddenly starting from 2016, he or she starts publishing with London School of Economics as an affiliation, then we can infer that between 2015 and 2016, that scientists moved from Germany to the UK. And, it's, uh, and it can be done at scale because we have millions of publications for millions of uh, authors. So let me show you a few uh, patterns that we observe. So this is a chart that has on the left-hand side patterns for females and on the right-hand right side for males over time. And it includes the top 10 destination countries for scientists. We see that the United States is uh, the top uh, destination country, even though it, uh, the relevance or the importance of uh, the United States has been decreasing slightly over time. The UK is steadily at second uh, spot. Then comes Germany, that is third, uh, between third and fourth, depending on the, on the years. We can clearly see a big rise for China here, both for men and women. China was not even part, oops, China was not even part of uh, the top 10 in 1998, but is now the third top destination for scientists uh, on, a global, uh, on a global scale. Italy is here, was number six for women in 1998, and now is sort of number 10 for women. It was number nine for men in 1998, and now it's sort of dropped off the chart for, uh, for men. The slightly declining trend for, for Italy. So this gives you a general sense of patterns and countries that are sort of attracting uh, scientists uh, over time. Now, science thrives when there is diversity, when there is exchange of ideas, when there's also balance. And so now I would like to show you something about uh, uh, one type of diversity, which is uh, gender diversity. So this is a chart that shows uh, the ratio between men and women in different dimensions. So if we look at the uh, x-axis, we have gender ratio among all researchers. So number of published men divided by number of published women. No, sorry, women to men, number of women divided by men. So if we had the exact equal number of uh, men and women in science, we would see a ratio of one. Instead, the median is about 4.47. This is for 1998 to 2002, meaning that for every 100 uh, scientists were men, there are 47 who are women. The y-axis shows the same ratio, but among internationally mobile scientists. And so we see that here the median was even lower, 0.32. So for every 100 men scientists, there are 32 women 
women scientists among those who are internationally mobile. And this is uh, particularly worrying because international mobility is what favors exchange of idea, uh, expansion of networks, and no normally sort of leads to professional uh, development. So it, this is the 45 degree line, which will sort of indicate that there is equality between the general population and the population of scientists, and this is a measure of the, of the gap. Now, we observe very large uh, gender inequalities. On the, one, on the other hand, the good news is that things are changing for the better. So if we look at the second chart, it's the same type of chart, but for the period from 2013 to 2017, we see that the gap uh, decreased from 0.42 to 0.24. The median values increase for, in both dimensions, both for uh, all researchers and uh, international and mobile researchers, but even more among internationally mobile uh, researchers. So it seems like uh, the trend is moving in the right direction. We see Italy here. Italy has been performing particularly well in that sense. It's above the median uh, in both dimensions among all researchers and among uh, migrant researchers. Germany is here. It has been improving compared to the previous uh, period. So it's moving in the right direction but it still remains uh, below the median among, uh, for both uh, dimensions. Okay, so this gives you a sense of trends in gender inequalities. Now we also looked at all these rates, we computed immigration rates for all countries, and then we tried to see whether there are some patterns that emerge. One thing that we wanted to consider was whether there is a relationship between migration of scientists and uh, economic growth. So what we did was that we looked uh, at the relationship between out-migration rates on the y-axis and GDP per capita on the x-axis. Uh, there are a lot of details in this uh, image, but you don't have to sort of worry about the details. What you can see is the pattern from the model-based estimates, which has a sort of uh, U-shape. So this means that the propensity to migrate, to migrate to a different country, tends to go down with economic development up to a certain point, up to about 25,000 uh, US dollars, 2017 US dollars in terms of GDP per capita, and then it goes up. So this tends to indicate that some of the uh, issues that have been labeled like brain drain perhaps were overstated, at least in the context of uh, uh, scholars and, and scientists like this propensity tends to sort of decrease as uh, higher education systems expand in uh, countries with low income. And then after a certain point, countries become more integrated in terms of, sort of science systems. There are more incentives to move across countries and we see that uh, mobility increases again. Okay, so I'm close to the end. Let me show you one slide that is specific to uh, Italy and Germany. So this chart shows a ratio. The, the ratio of flows from Italy to Germany divided by flows from Germany to Italy. So if we look at around the period 2000, we were sort of oscillating around one. So that meant that for every scientist who moved from Italy to Germany, each year there was one scientist from uh, Germany to Italy the other way around, so a, a fairly fair balanced trend. But then in the last decade, we see that this uh, ratio has been increasing quite a bit. And so reaching, for example, 1.8, that is for every uh, person who moves from Germany to Italy, there are 1.8 scientists who move from Italy to Germany. Now by pure coincidence, if we look at the last number, that's the golden ratio. I don't know if we want to sort of consider this the golden ratio. I will let sort of, uh, each of you can make uh, uh, his or her own conclusions of what the right uh, ratio is. But one, th one thing that I wanted to point out is that this, this sort of set of people, so people who move, for example, from Germany to Italy or from Italy to Germany, 
are very special people because they know the systems in both countries very well. And so if they're given the right resources and the right, the right institutions, they can really make the most of it and contribute to growth for both countries and more broadly for the European Union. So this is something valuable to consider. These are people that need uh, more support. Now let me just uh, end here. If you want to have sort of more data, if you want to sort of see uh, for yourself these trends for other countries and so on, I would recommend that you can take a look at this new database that we created at the Max Planck Institute for Demography Research. It gives you a sense of trends for other countries. Thank you all for your interest. Thank you.